Yo, yo, Becky. Hey, John. Hey, what friends. I'm just so excited today. I've been wanting to have this conversation for months. It's a Time. really important conversation, really timely. And I just feel like super honored that we have today's guest that we have. We really do. And I think this conversation is we're about to dive into the environment and what everyone's role is within just keeping our planet healthy. It's so uh, so prominent right now in the media, and it really is going to be a generational conversation today. We're going to be talking about what we can do in our own little corner of the world to help make the earth a, a better, a cleaner, and a safer place for all of us. So today we are joined by Lauren Osdahl and Michelle Epstein with the Sierra Club, which the Sierra Club was founded Legendary. in 1892. Like this is before yeah. my grandparents even came in through Ellis Island. Right. And it is a super um, incredible organization. It's the na nation's largest and most influential grassroots or environmental organization. John, they have 3 million members and supporters. I mean, 3 I'm sorry, 3.7 million. These two um, are both really instrumental in the development side of growing this membership. And so Lauren comes to us with this really amazing background. She, for more than 15 years, was the director of development at Mother Jones, which if you haven't followed them, a really powerful independent media uh, source, incredible website, incredible storytelling. Um, but she came to Sierra Club in 2015 as Dr Deputy Director of Advancement. And so she works major gifts and leading major gift strategy for a team of more than 20 different gift officers. So incredible amount of talent and experience. Well, I wonder if y'all would share just um, a little bit, either one of y'all can take this, just give us a picture. I have heard of Sierra Club since I was a little kid, you know, and I know it's ties to the national parks and all those kind of things. But what is it, what does the, you know, the organization do today? I know that it's huge in the advocacy space and doing so much on a legislative level too. Can you just kind of give us a footprint and understanding of how big the organization is and what y'all, your priorities are? Yeah, Michelle, I'm happy to start. Um, yeah. So the organization, as you said, has been around for um, just shy of 130 years. We um, started really as a hiking outfit and and um, helped to establish some of our, uh, the biggest national parks that many of you are, have probably frequented, including Yosemite. Um, but really, um, in the kind of mid 2000s, climate change really became such a central issue to the work, and we recognized that to enjoy the planet, um, we need to protect the planet, um, and so. So really sort of elevating our work, looking at how um, the energy sector really makes a difference on um, carbon emissions and uh, global warming and climate change. And so started to launch a lot of campaigns really focused on um, transitioning to a clean energy um, uh, environment where much of what we were getting to power our world um, is coming from clean uh, renewable resources. Um, so we launched campaigns such as the Beyond Coal campaign, which is one of the largest campaigns um, and most successful environmental campaigns in the country, um, working to transition off of um, coal uh, and onto um, clean, clean renewable energy. Um, and that uh, campaign has been quite successful. Um, and it's been a campaign that we've also waged really alongside many partner groups, mm -hmm. uh, many groups on the ground working locally um, in small venues and large venues uh, to really kind of create a different type of reality for our world. Um, but that's not the only thing we do. We continue to do uh, national monument designation. We get kids outdoors. We work with veterans groups um, who are both uh, uh, doing outdoor work and also sort of using nature as a healing mechanism for folks who are coming back from combat with PTSD. So there's a lot of ways in which um, Sierra Club operates. And I think the thing that makes us not totally unique, but, but you know, definitely one of a few organizations is we have presence in all 50 states. So every single state there is a Sierra Club chapter, including in Oklahoma, um, uh, as well as, uh, so there's 64 chapters across the country. There are a few extra in California where we were first founded, but, um, but and we also have groups of sort of established groups of volunteers that are uh, more formal than just um, your average individual volunteer who works at the Sierra Club. And there's over 200 of those across the country working on local issues, as well as some of our national priorities. Um, and then, as you mentioned, we have, um, I think it's up of 3.7 million 
million members and champions who are either supporting this work uh, financially um, or are engaging in our work by taking action on online petitions or getting involved in our political campaign. Um, we had 37,000 people volunteer for this year's election, which was just off the charts. Um, wow really high levels of engagement and really a high level of interest of continuing that work and really thinking about ways that we can build ambition for a cleaner, healthier planet uh, in the future. This How is awesome. such a <laughs> timely topic. I think right. the reason, I mean, if, I think the reason it resonated so much with me is I think the pace of climate change is accelerating to the point that you know, events that once happened, you know, in geological timescales are no, are now happening so quickly, you know, that humans are beginning to recognize like them as immediate threats to our survival, to our prosperity. And, and never has that been on center stage. It doesn't feel like more than in the last couple of years. And so I really am so curious about this advocacy piece because Every nonprofit, you know, has to leverage grassroots at some point. They have to lean on their community. They have to lean on the people that care about their mission. And you have done it on such a large and global scale. I wonder if you could just talk to us about, and, and Michelle, maybe this is a question to you. You know, if you have 3.7 million people that are fighting for change, how do you mobilize them? How do you engage with them? How do you steward them? I mean, it just blows my mind as a fundraiser to think about. So I would love any, any uh, insight into that question. Oh, so there's many dimensions to it, right? So from a fundraising perspective, we have a, a really large multi-channel operation. We have 20 different uh, direct response programs uh, that are either the uh, mail, email, digital. Uh, we still call people and they still, they still pick up the phone, particularly this year. Uh, tele, telephone yeah, can't hide, been, right? Oh, I bet. <laughs> just phones are home. And direct mail also this year has been super, the response rates that we've seen in the mail ourselves and other organizations very strong because I don't know about you guys, but one of the highlights of my day nowadays is actually going to get, is actually going to get the mail. Um, and then we have, in terms of personal stewardship, we have one of the few organizations that has an in-house member care team. So we have a team of 12 folks that um, uh, before we were, we're no longer in our offices, we're all working from home. So now they're, they're distributed across different locations, but that are taking calls uh, from our members and supporters and answering emails. Last year, they answered over 50,000 phone calls and over 120,000 emails. So the next time you guys think that maybe your inbox is overflowing a bit, <laughs> think about the Sierra Club uh, member care team that answered 120,000. And these are not emails. yes or no questions. You know, these are probably existential no. questions of yes, explaining some complex of things. Some are, are definitely right. existential questions that require uh, a conversation, as we would say. Right. But I um, love that because it's going to give you a higher level of engagement because of the personalization uh, just alone. I mean, you are going to feel seen. You are going to feel heard. You're going to feel empowered. I mean, to me, it's no wonder that you have 3.7 yeah. million members if you can engage at that level. Yeah. And then what we do is we meet every other week with the member care team and we have a, a, a concept we call voice of the member, which is everyone on the team shares both positives and negatives that they're hearing, you know, folks call in or email about. So we get ahead of, you know, we, we monitor trends. And if there's things that we can fix, whether it's about our fundraising, about any sort of outreach, we uh, then bring that back to the organization. So we, we make fixes based on what uh, the, the feedback that we're getting, you know, from our folks. Um, we also have a social media member care rep. So there's someone who is sort of scouring our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and trying to, you know, interact with folks in real time, because that's where a lot of folks uh, may either be saying something positive or they might be complaining and we want to kind of connect with them right where they are, you know, in social media. Um, and then we've also added in the past two years a bilingual rep so that we can interact with folks uh, if they uh, are feel more comfortable speaking in, in Spanish. Uh, in, in terms of folks who are members. Um, and then a few years ago, we instituted a concierge team, uh, which is a group of, um, I, I wouldn't call them fundraisers, just folks that are personally cultivating um, our mid-level donors that are, they're, those are folks that are give between a thousand and ten thousand dollars a year to the Sierra Club. And they're just calling to have chats with folks to understand what motivated them to join the club in the first place, to tell them that they are their like sort of their, their personal point of contact at the club. Um, and in, 
And in not asking for money and just, you know, communicating with folks, they've actually been very successful fundraisers because folks have, you know, have strengthened their bond with the organization through that one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, with the concierge that has reached out to them. You guys okay. are such pros. We got to, yeah, we got to highlight some of this. We need to unpack this. We got to recap yeah. this. <laughs> okay. I counted at least 15 people that are just listening, right? At any given yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And part of that job, and we talk so much about what are keys to fundraising success, it's listening to your donors and understanding their needs, understanding their passions and interests. So I think that really stuck out to me that you've not only recognized that, mm -hmm. but you've staffed around it and you've mm -hmm. built processes around it because obviously you have to when you're at three plus million potential members here mm -hmm. or even more than that. So I love that that's baked into your DNA because I can imagine so much connection comes from that. It was also great this year because when, when everything hit with COVID, we also uh, had the concierge team uh, reach out to folks and just literally just see how they were doing. So it was, uh, it, it gave us a mechanism to be very close to our donors during a very, you know, uh, a year that, I mean, it's still not over, we're still uh, in the middle of it, but during a very uncertain you know, time, we were able to really have really close connections with a lot of our donors. Yeah, and I think that the same would be true for how the gift officers operate. Um, you know, I think so many organizations make the mistake of thinking about fundraising as a transactional relationship, um, as opposed to a transformational one, and really about relationship building and trust. Um, and so, to me, the real work of fundraising um, is actually outside of the solicitation itself, and really in the cultivation and stewardship of a donor. So those touch points, those moves where you are just checking in, uh, asking how the grandkids are, um, wondering how the family's doing during lockdown or during this pandemic, um, actually moves the relationship much um, further along and engenders the donor to the organization in ways that um, just coming to the donor and explaining all the stuff we're doing and then, hey, can you support this? That really, um, I don't think, fosters the kind of meaningful relationship and meaningful touch points that we really um, focus on for, for my team and for how we do that fundraising. Um, it's really listening to the donor and meeting them where they are and then connecting their philanthropic priorities and passions with the work that we're doing. Because I guarantee you, we're doing something that they care about um, at one level or another. So if you're wondering how the Sierra Club has 3.7 million members, one is the, obviously the case for support is beautiful and it's so necessary and it's great. But this is also because you treat donors exactly how you should treat donors. And that's why they would want to stick with you and want to grow their giving with you and be, make transformation happen. So thank you for all of that. I think you guys are such incredible pros and the way that you've just organized your development team is really paramount and and something that i hope people can look at and see how you could do that at your own shop whatever size that is so so good um something that i'd like to ask you know i think your cause is so interesting because you know it plays in the big headlines you know and mm -hmm. on a friday night we can sit down and watch netflix and a couple of weeks ago we watched the new david attenborough documentary and there's, there's so much cultural conversation about these topics that I just wonder how do you, especially as a storyteller, Lauren, and a journalist, mm -hmm. how do y'all harness those um, storylines and then, you know, sh position it kind of in a positive way to put Sierra Club as part of the solution? I'm just curious how y'all do that and, and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's similar to how we approach our fundraising. It's about the people um, and kind of connecting and telling stories from the heart. So um, when I came to Sierra Club, a lot of the materials we pulled together, while really impressive, were sort of really technical. Um, we were talking about megawatts and gigawatts and silver dioxide and um, either really technical wonky things or things that were so vast. Climate change is such a huge problem. It's really challenging for folks to connect to it personally. Um, it either feels far off in the future or it feels disconnected to their day-to-day -day life. Um, I think we're starting to see that change in people where um, extreme weather events, I mean, cer certainly the fires here in California, um, that, you know, that is a real eye-opener for many of the folks here living in, um, living all throughout the state. I mean, it happens in Malibu as well as in remote areas, um, but the, the hurricanes in the Gulf and everything in between, droughts, droughts uh, in the middle of the country. So that, that really starts to personalize the issue for folks. And so it's really about telling stories that have a human element. Um, and that human element could be the communities that are disproportionately impacted by climate change um, or environmental injustice. 
um, as well as the communities and the folks that are working to change that and really sort of focusing on um, a volunteer that's been working for the past 20 years with the Sierra Club and the work that they've been able to accomplish in partnership with the organization or one of our lead campaigners working, um, you know, fighting um, against a coal plant um, and sort of was a David and Goliath situation that they were able to, to win. So um, it's really, again, bringing it down to a human level and a relatable level and really lifting up all of the amazing people who make this work possible. I, I love your point around that because I, I think one of the things that has confounded me so much is that there are certain things that, you know, about the world right now, especially in the United States, that have become so politicized. And, you know, we try to really be an apolitical company, but we are always going to err on the side of being kind of embracing community and differences. And I'm really curious, just like as a, as a writer and as a storyteller, how do you combat a narrative when all of a sudden the environment has become this massively political issue and by virtue of your political party, you're either on one side or you're on. And to me, it's just, it, it's an issue that affects everyone. And if you have children and you care about the next generation, then you're gonna wanna lean into this a little bit. How do you, how does that create like sort of a tiptoe effect or do you tiptoe or are you just unapologetically in your space? Yeah, and I think that, you know, look, Sierra Club's been an organization where Republicans, independents, and Democrats have found a home. And I think it re your political party can be uh, independent of uh, the idea that you want to protect the natural spaces around you. Um, you know, there are many conservatives who are um, strong conservationists. But I think over the last several years, Sierra Club has definitely moved into more of a politically progressive space. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly this administration was not um, a friend to the environment. And a lot of the policies and the rollbacks they did were quite damaging, not only to a lot of the progress we've made as an environmental community, but to communities um, uh, of people, and particularly communities of color all across the country. And so the pandemic in many ways has sort of brought that front and center as well, as we're seeing different communities disproportionately impacted. Um, and some of that connection is related to pollution, environmental toxins um, that have plagued those communities in ways that um, they haven't plagued um, other communities. So we are very intentional about that. Um, I think some of the um, uh, Black, Black Lives Matter movements that came up this spring and are continuing to um, be part of our conversation certainly are part of the dynamic of how we're talking at the Sierra Club and how we're thinking about the intersectionality of these issues, um, as well as how we partner and work with um, groups on the ground. Um, that is really how we get um, some of our biggest wins across the finish line. It's really about partnership. It's really about listening. Um, sometimes we lead those fights. Sometimes we take a back seat and let the community groups lead. Um, those, those have been true in um, a lot of the fights we've done uh, against um, pipeline uh, build out. Um, and in many ways have been working alongside um, indigenous communities who've really been leading the fight um, along those um, uh, you know, for pipeline infrastructure build out. So, you know, it's, it, it can be quite complicated. Um, and I don't know how you divorce politics from this issue because a lot of the folks who are writing legislation are the ones who are either going to be your friend or foe, um, depending upon, you know, what kind of legislation they're writing. And Sierra Club is a C4. Um, so we have the ability to work in a legislative context um, through contributions that are made by our members, um, as well as our major donors. Um, and then we have the Sierra Club Foundation, which um, really supports all of our C3, C3 work or charitable work. So there's a, there's a hybrid there um, that we can balance and it helps to inform the kind of work that we're able to do and where we can push a little bit more aggressively on the political side of things. I'm so fascinated by all of it. I just, I just think it's so interesting. And, but it, but it all comes back to me to your original mission. Just if you have a base of passionate people who are willing to chase, you know, goodness and wanting to chase conservation. And um, I even think of like access, you know, access for all. 
then, you know, this is a home for you. And I have to believe that even in quarantine, we've seen massive upticks of people going out, you know, into nature. I know my family has gotten out way more than we were Mine before. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I think probably everybody. And so I, I do think that that, I mean, I'm curious if you uh, have seen an uptick in your membership just from this year since people have been in quarantine and finding you. Uh, so this year uh, through October, we our membership has grown by about. So we have paid our paid membership uh, is about eight hundred and forty thousand folks. So we've had a sixty thousand uh, member leaps uh, year over year between twenty nineteen and twenty twenty. That's a lot of new donors to yeah. <laughs> pull yeah. up the pipeline. Welcome to the and, club. Yeah. Welcome to yeah. The, so guys, we talk in big numbers. And I know, Lauren, this is part of your story is like when you arrived, we're talking a little bit in stats, these things um, that you wanted to humanize it. Would you humanize it for us in maybe a story either one of y'all could go and maybe it's on the philanthropy side of somebody's donor story, or maybe it's just an impact that you've seen that's really tugged at your heart. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I was thinking about this in preparation of this call and, and you know, it's hard to pull out one story for one particular donor that um, resonates with me completely. Although I, I just, I've been in, in a progressive or social justice, um, uh, fundraising space for my entire career. And I'm always in awe of people who care less about sort of a name on a wall or a wing of a hospital, even though those are wonderful gifts. Um, they're really about changing the world around them and addressing, um, problems or inequities they're seeing, um, uh, in sort of our daily life. And so that is always quite inspiring to me. I think the thing that I will say kind of goes back to the idea around putting people first. When I came to Sierra Club, um, our top 10 major donors um, were giving around $35 million a year. Uh, seven out of those 10 were institutional donors. Um, and they were primarily, I think, like seven out of 10 of them were giving to restricted projects. So it really sort of hamstrings the organization when the, organ when the funding isn't as flexible as possible. So we can really pivot towards the most and more uh, important pressing or, or um, new opportunities that come down the horizon. Um, five years later, as we shifted our focus really to kind of a donor-centric um, approach to fundraising, storytelling, li lifting up our people, um, and talking through the impact of flexible fundraising, that um, dynamic has completely shifted. So our top 10 donors now, three out of the 10 are institutional, seven are individual donors. Um, they are giving $20 million more than they were um, wow. just back ago. Awesome. Um, they're funding mostly flexible projects, which really has helped the organization scale and um, broaden our reach across the country, but also tackle some of these issues as they arrived. Um, even in our current administration, there's a lot more defense we had to play on some of the biggest um, legislative victories that you had named we had had years ago, and they're starting to chip away at. So we're able to pivot to defense as well as um, uh, opportunities on offense, where we've made a lot of progress under this administration um, in and of itself, um, retiring coal plants, getting cities to adopt 100% clean energy, getting more and more kids outdoors, save for this year, but we'll, we'll be back. Um, so that I think is really powerful and really powerful for all organizations, no matter your issue, when you're thinking through how to um, organize your fundraising operation and the ways in which you're really focusing on um, aspirational and visionary um, ideas where a donor can really see themselves making an impact at any level of their giving. Hmm. Michelle, so what about you? Is there a story so have, that sticks out I to have you? I a, heart, a heartwarming story. Um, so we have, um, as we discussed before, we have many long tenured members at the Sierra Club. Um, and a few years ago, uh, my team put together a, a program to have certificates of appreciation that go out to folks uh, you know, when they hit a certain anniversary, like a, a five year, 10 year, 30 year, we've had people at, you know, 50 year anniversaries. Oh my gosh. Um, and um, it was flagged to us that a, a woman had taken um, the certificate and put it up on her Facebook page. And it was a certificate for her son. And it turns out that um, her son had passed away about uh, over, 30, over 30 years ago. Um, and uh, she had initially started a membership for him as a child. And then after he passed away, she kept his membership going for 35 years um, in his memory. 
um, uh, because he had a very strong affiliation with the club and all the things that we stood for. Um, and so when we uh, found out uh, that this was happening in all this time, we flagged this to our executive director and we had decided to uh, give her son a posthumous uh, life. He, had, he really did have a life membership in the Sierra Club, but we wanted to you know, really recognize it and, and make that official. Uh, so we did that and, um, and our concierge team, which we talked about earlier, reached out to her to get more of her son's life story and background. And we feature that in a, you know, we're trying to have our donor communications be more about the donors and less about the club. To a, I mean, to a certain extent, we always want to talk about what impact the club is having, but we're trying to share the donor stories with each other um, when we have our donor newsletters uh, in any other way that we can, you know, we can share out the story. So this was, it was very moving to us that literally this, so the, the so her son had, has had a, 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 a membership with us longer than he actually, you know, lived. It's pretty amazing. And that right there is next level stewardship. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, and, and to, to lift that story up and make it so attainable and to celebrate that, I mean, I think about what that must have meant to that mother to, to have a spotlight on her child in that way. Um, that's a great story. And, and actually, it's a great segue to this question that I have for you all about children as it relates to the environment, because I happen to have two little environmentalists at my house. And I just wonder if all children are not naturally predisposed, most children, to love being outdoors, to love animals. My girls love the, the TV show Wild Kratts. They watch it religiously. I mean, it's about learning everything you can about the superpowers of animals. And they feel such an ownership to keeping the environment clean. And my daughter, created an invention when she was four for a trash can belt. I should show you guys a picture so she can, and she's got her own trash grabber and, and we still do that. She's 10. And I just look at Greta Thunberg and I look at just what children are doing in the advocacy space because children I see are so passionate about making sure that the, the environment, wildlife, these natural spaces, at what, how can we as adults kind of listen to them and how are you harnessing that in your organization? I mean, I think you just said it, we have to listen to them, right? Um, they really do understand this issue in ways that I don't think maybe we did in our own youth. Um, certainly Greta and the work of organizations like the Sunrise Movement are really sort of harnessing the power of the youth movement. Um, they understand, I have two kids myself who also love Wildcrats, um, and my daughter who's now almost 13, um, really understands what climate change means for her future, and it's a part of the conversation that she has with her friends socially. Um, so they are quite aware, they want to make a difference, they also are enjoying our natural spaces um, as part of this pandemic and something we can do as families. Um, but they also know that they're going to inherit a very complicated you know, planet. Um, my kids wear, you know, masks when the smoke level is too high here in Northern California. And that sort of broke my heart, you know, that that's part of their, um, their they'll, they'll be part of a natural childhood memory for them. Um, and so there are a lot of different ways that kids can get involved. They certainly could get involved in, um, you know, with memberships. We have another um, component to our fundraising called Team Sierra, which is around um, sort of community-based, not um, you know, fundraising where you maybe you're going to go on a really long hike and you want friends and family members to support that um, effort. And then that money will come back to the Sierra Club. We had two really young um, mm -hmm. kids uh, may raise money for the Sierra Club just in this pandemic, doing you know, things from you know, lemonade sales to um, their own hikes, walking with their, with their families. Um, and so that always inspires me that they're not only willing to make a difference, but they're getting involved and raising money and giving back at such a young age. And I'm inspired by that. And so I really want to follow their lead more than I want them to follow mine. <laughs> Well, I would say also, we haven't done this yet, but it is on my uh, list of things that I'd like to do is have a family membership, right? We have our memberships now are really oriented just toward parents, but is there a way that we can uh, include kids and have some you know, benefits and uh, interactions uh, that uh, will be meaningful for children? Um, we just did, um, again, in, in, in part of our listening culture, we just did a series of focus groups around, our, we have a magazine uh, called Sierra uh, that comes out uh, every other month. Um, and we had a lot of feedback uh, from folks who are parents about how could we add more children's content into the magazine 
uh, so that uh, we can, can we can educate kids uh, and get them engaged on you know that that sort of uh, content. Well, something we ask all of our guests is, "What's your one good thing?" And um, you've given a ton, and I kind of want to do a follow-up question after this, but I'd love to hear your one good thing. This could be a piece of advice or a your secret sauce, secret to success. I'll start with you, Lauren. You know, I mean, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but I think it's just putting people first. Um, that is, you know, in fundraising, people can get really scared about the idea of asking for money. To me, it's asking, uh, you know, for help in any arena, whether it's of someone's time, of their financial resources. But when you put people first, it is so rewarding. Um, there are donor relationships I've had since my career began 20 years ago that I consider almost family members. I've been invited to funerals. I've been invited to weddings. Um, and so it is such a rewarding career and it is such a rewarding job to be at sort of the epicenter of facilitating those who have means um, with making positive change in the world. And I feel totally honored uh, that this is where I've spent my last 20 years of my life, my adult, my adult career, um, really in that intersection. Um, so I, that's really my, my answer to, to what's good is just really putting people first, that authenticity and that genuine relationship development can go really, really far. I love that. Thank you, Lauren. What about you, Michelle? So I would, I would, um, Add on to what Lorna said, definitely people first listening more than talking and asking questions so just always being very open and curious about uh, what's going on in the world. And then also experiencing it yourself. So uh, what I've always done, uh, whether I've been in a direct response for business or in direct response in nonprofit is um, I've joined the Sierra Club myself as a member so I can experience what, my, what the actual members are, are experiencing and what other, org I've joined other organizations so that you are, it's not just something that's sort of uh, abstract, but that you are kind of living every day what the average donor is experiencing uh, at large organizations and even some, some you know, mid-sized and smaller organizations just to see, you know, what, what does that experience feel like? And um, by joining your own organization, you could also see where there's certain processes or communications or just, does everything all hang together? Because we're in a very large organization where we're um, coordinating across several different departments. And does the whole experience kind of hang together? Because uh, you're only uh, uh, shepherding sort of one, one part of that. So it's very, it's very insightful to be, it's almost like I call it, it's almost like mystery shopping your own you know, organization to see how things feel. Yeah, totally. I think that is awesome and expert advice. And what's funny is I teased the, uh, that I wanted to ask you one more question because I, d I hate direct mail, like as a practitioner, okay? And I'm just, I know I'm not alone because we consult with clients and I hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. So embark on us, impart on us. What's some ways we can fall in love with direct mail? Give us your best yeah. couple of tips about how to level okay. up your direct so, mail. So and I love the, the first why, one. I guess the reason why I love direct mail is that most of our members and most of our uh, lower dollar donors are still coming through the mail. So I like not what, dead. what works. <laughs> I like what works. Uh, and, yes. and until um, the generation that donates the most to our organization right now is still one that grew up uh, on direct mail and is most, uh, you know, is most responsive to it. So uh, about 60, 65% of our members every year come in through uh, direct mail. Wow. Uh, so it is far, it is far from uh, dead. Um, um, we um, give folks options if they don't want to have as much. Once they become a member, you can, you know, decide that you want to pulse like your preference uh, for it. But I, I don't think there's anything to dislike uh, because it works. We also try to make it as eco-friendly as possible, right? So we're using uh, 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 re recycled and recyclable paper, um, eco-friendly inks. So we're doing, we're, we're um, we're doing what we can to make sort of the, the footprint of it, right, and the, the, the environmental impact of it uh, as, you know, to lessen it as much as we can. A lot of folks find the direct mail is the way that they're being communicated with about the, you know, organization. So when I get something from us, like I, ha I have a piece here, right, it's an update. This is our update about what our action plan is for the coming year, right? It's included with the reply forms in the envelope, but I'm learning a lot about what, you know, what we're doing by having this. And we have heard that many times there's 
it was kind of a bridge between sort of the lower dollar donors and major donors. And many times um, mail is suppressed when that happens, or there's a disconnect between yeah. sort of the two parts of the organization. And uh, we've heard from um, many of our counterparts at other organizations and our own members that folks, um, you know, they miss getting, this is, this is like their lifeline to us. Like this is the communication that they like to read. They don't necessarily view it as I'm asking you, I'm asking you, I'm asking you. So it's, 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 uh, I, I think it's more leave it to the folks that are receiving it to make the judgment about it versus our Boom. like imposing our own, you know, there you go. <laughs> there's, are you, are you encouraging us to listen to our donors? There we go. <laughs> Never say no for the donor. Number one rule. That's it. <laughs> I love it. 20 years from now, you know, it's a new, a new generation, right? Maybe, uh, you know, folks will be, uh, there'll be some, there's some technology that hasn't been invented yet. And that'll be the right, the way that we uh, interact with folks or, you know, we'll be Venmoing, you know, donations over to like, it'll be something that won't have as, but this is, this, these are folks that literally have grown up with this as the mechanism in which they give. I just, I love your mission so very much. I think this topic is so incredibly important right now. I mean, our, our environment needs us right now. And I don't care if you're living on the Arctic shelf or if you're in a big city, you know, wherever we are, we need to improve the world around us. We talk about that so often. So how could our listeners connect with uh, Sierra Club? How could they get involved? Where could they find some resources? Hook us up. Yeah, I mean, so like most modern places, you just go to the World Wide Web, um, sierraclub.org to find ways that you can become a member. Um, uh, you can support their volunteer opportunities and there's information on how to get involved in your local chapter. Um, so uh, I, I'd start there. Um, if folks are interested in supporting and want to make a C3 charitable contribution, um, they can go to sierraclubfoundation.org and that would be a way to make a gift um, that has charitable tax deductive purposes. It's so important. And Lauren, thank you. Michelle, just appreciate your insight. I mean, it's there's a reason you all have been in this business for almost 20 years because you are massively successful and and you definitely have the passion to back it up. Well, thanks for having us. Guys. It's been a pleasure.